lovely and darling viewers, it's Jen here at Check Her Joy, and this time I'm reviewing Hidden Figures by Margot Lee Shutterly. This is the American dream and the untold story of the black women mathematician, mathematicians who helped win the space race. So this book primarily focuses on three female um, black mathematicians at Langley in Virginia, and they are Dorothy Vaughn, who was the first um, black female supervisor at Langley, uh, Mary Jackson, who was one of, if not the first, uh, black engineer, black female engineer at Langley, and Katherine Johnson, who um, was a mathematician who played a really big role in calculating trajectories for rockets, especially um, Mark Shepard's suborbital flight, John Glenn's orbital flight, and the moon landing, which is really awesome and impressive. So I first heard about this book when I saw the previews for the movie and was like super excited and then it's a book and I had to read the book. I really enjoyed this book. It's a pretty optimistic look at um, race and sexism, which is, I guess, strange. Um, so it doesn't gloss over the racism and segregation that was happening in the South, especially in Virginia. Um, and it doesn't overlook the sexism that would happen in the workplace, uh, like what women were expected to want from their jobs and stuff, or like the highest like cap they could ever hope to achieve. Um, but these are women who succeeded. These are the success stories. These are the kind of the exceptions. And it's encouraging to read that, like these women who did break those barriers and push those limits um, and achieved some really amazing stuff. And um, they were also mentors to each other, but also the women below them. So a lot of Mary Jackson's work uh, later in her career was helping women and other minorities get uh, promotions and uh, placements within NASA. So this book does a good job of balancing kind of this math, science, uh, like what the actual work was with their personal lives and this human element and then also the historical context of what's happening at the time and in the area, um, which I really liked. Most of this is written in short sections, so it would be like a page or two talking about something and then it changes to, um, so it'd be like a, t a page or two talking about one specific thing that uh, Dorothy Vaughn was working on, and then maybe it'll be another page about her family life, and then j another section about like the historical um, significance of the things that were happening at the time. And so it balances it well and it never got boring because it's changing a lot. Um, I was never like lost with like what was happening, um, except for maybe a few times when they were like talking about two different Catherines at the same time. And I'm like, okay, which Catherine was that? Um, but overall it does a good job of keeping everything straight making it entertaining and interesting, um, which is a really hard balance to do. So I thoroughly appreciated it. <laughs> so this book starts off in the 1940s uh, during World War II, and we see the importance of these female mathematicians, these women who are doing the calculations by hand uh, because we don't have like electronic computers like we think of them. Um, they don't even have like these pocket calculators yet. <laughs> So they're still using sled rules and these really big bulky adding machines to do the math. Um, and a lot of these women got hired just by necessity. All the, like, the men were enlisting in the war. And so to do the computations, they just by necessity needed women. And they, need, they couldn't afford to exclude black women because the, the need was too great. And so anybody with a college education in mathematics was like... Can, could be considered for the job. So this book places a strong importance on education and talent and just working for what you want, like to be um, the best that you can be is the best way to kind of advance and achieve. Um, and also, um, there are also several points where these women had to stand up for themselves and like point out to the men who are in charge that, hey, this isn't all right. Like, Dorothy Vaughn having to say, hey, I've been doing this job where I've been in charge of this department for two years. Can you just make me the official supervisor? Like, hello. Or Mary Jackson fighting to become an engineer because 
uh, the guys at the top level just assumed that women wanted to stay home. And she's like, ah, uh, no, actually, I would like to go work on that Quinn title. Thank you. And also just the importance of being the best at what they are. So Katherine Johnson was amazing at being able to do this math mathematics and these computations and also kind of not just do the computations that were put in front of her, but also think abstractly about it and figure out how to do things that hadn't been done before. Um, that she got this reputation from the other, like the men and the other people in the departments and like gained recognition by that because her work was always perfect and on par and she could do it quickly. So like in her, Catherine Johnson's case, uh, John Glenn wouldn't go up until Catherine Johnson uh, check the math. Like, he didn't trust the computer, like, the machine he wanted. Like, if Katherine Johnson says it's okay, then it's okay. It's good. Um, I think it was also Katherine Johnson who was running, like, the what-if scenarios. So what if this happens? What if this breaks down? What if we can't do this? Um, which came into play with the Apollo 13, where the navigation... <laughs> um, which came to be really important during Apollo 13 when the navigation computers went down and they had to navigate by um like putting the earth in the window so they could find their way and know where they are um and because she had already thought out the what ifs beforehand that that was part of their training before they even went up was to know how to navigate by the stars um which is really cool there were a ton of like tiny little battles that these women fought that may have seemed like insignificant at the time but overall kind of lead to this big chipping away at the system. So in the 40s, there was a segregated cafeteria. So they all worked in NASA and they were eating in the same room as all these other uh, engineers and stuff. And But the women had to sit at this one table that was labeled colored and there weren't any men at the time in the 40s because it was like the men were off at war. So it was just the black females sitting at this one table and like Every day, one of the women would, like, take that sign away and hide it. And you do it enough times that eventually the people in the cafeteria apparently got tired of having to replace the sign. So they just left it. Like, their table was still segregated. They were still sitting, to, like, with each other. But they didn't have this constant reminder in the sign that said colored, like, reminding them that. Um, or there's a part in this book where Mary Jackson gets sent over to one of the other buildings. And there is no colored ladies room there so she was having to go all the way across um campus like miles away to use the bathroom and she got fed up with it and just started using the women's bathroom like the white women's bathroom um and how that slowly started like breaking down the segregation like why are we doing this <laughs> i'm making people question like the routine um so basically they had all these little tiny fights that kind of slowly got the other people around them to think about like why are we segregating this stuff like is it necessary um so <laughs> i loved those little tiny moments in this book and there are a lot of them um within the bigger like historical context they talk about like um the lunch counter sit-ins that were happening where we have these college students going to these diners and just sitting at these white only counters and refusing to get up being peaceful about it but not um like not giving in and how that slowly made a difference or um, one of my favorite parts was at the very towards the end where they talk about star trek and the influence that just seeing um Uhura on screen to have a black female lead character and to have somebody in the sciences and in space and what a difference that made to like future astronauts that these black female astronauts thought like when they were young thought that hey I could do that um but also to the women who are already working at NASA they're like hey that's us um which is really cool and I'm gonna cry <laughs> a big part of these women's lives were also the community that they lived in so while at work maybe segregation wasn't always quite as apparent as necessity and talent brought them working into like the mainstream um projects and stuff so they were working with white men um, or other women or other african americans but their community at home was still segregated um but like that was also 
um, kind of strength in numbers to to like go home and have something normal or to be able to interact with stuff. Yeah. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, it does look at their personal lives, so we get to see their families a bit. I'm talking about their children. So Mary Jackson especially wasn't involved in her children's lives and becoming like a scout leader. And it talks about her doing like um, the soapbox derby with her son and how he became the first uh, African American to win the soapbox derby in Virginia and how we got to go to Akron, Ohio to compete in the national one and like what a big deal that was and that how a lot of that was Mary like uh, helping her son and like tutoring him. So Mary Jackson also had a like strong desire to get women and other African Americans like to see the bigger world. So like she was given the opportunity to become like a, uh, a national Girl Scout leader or something and she um, convinced her assistant troop leader to do it instead. So this woman who had never been outside of Virginia now was traveling across the country, um, which is really cool. Like seeing the bigger world. I loved this book. It did take me a while to read it. It took me about a month total to get through the entire book. Um, not because it's bad, but just because I wanted to kind of absorb it all. And also that sometimes it got kind of dense and like just wanted to read something light and fluffy too. On the whole, I highly, highly, highly recommend this book. It's amazing. There is also a young readers edition aimed towards like middle schoolers kind of thing. So if you're worried about the math being too hard or something, um, that's an option. Um, or if you have a middle schooler who would be interested in this. Um, the movie is also amazing. It doesn't follow the strict like chronology of things that happened in real life. Um, the book is very theatrical and condenses everything down into like 1960, 1961, and really just focuses on the Mercury missions, which are important, <laughs> but not everything. And so a lot of the fights that were happening over the course of like three decades uh, got jammed back into one decade and uh, went to one year. And it seems um, it's awesome is what I'm saying. And you should totally go see it. But don't think that like what happened in the movie is strictly speaking 100% accurate this is the day it happened and how it happened and who it happened to um, I also really love the movie so I recommend them both a lot like a lot go go check out this book guys basically go do it right now okay <laughs> peace out I love you guys and keep reading bye